Okay, so we go on to look at the second type of diagrammatic representation of potentials. And these are frost diagrams. Frost diagrams are oxidation state diagrams and they are qualitative, so they can give us an indication of how species are going to behave, but not necessarily any information about the amount. Okay, on the left is a typical frost diagram and it is a plot of the number of electrons multiplied by the standard potential over here against oxidation number okay and you will see that there is increasing stability going from the top of the graph downwards and the oxidation number is obviously going to increase from left to right in that direction. In this diagram, the most stable oxidation state is the one that's indicated. And that is why the frost diagram is so useful. All right, so we are going to be able to use the oxidation number of a specific element, X. And you may be wondering, what is this new, the new value? The new value is the number of electrons transformed to form an oxidation state starting from oxidation state zero. Okay, there may also be multiple potentials on a Latimer diagram. Um, often what we're going to need to do is use a Latimer diagram to construct a frost diagram. And you will then recall what you learned from the previous section of these diagrammatic representations that you may have to do a calculation of a non-adjacent potential using the formula at the bottom of the slide, this one here that you've learned before. Okay, here is an example of a frost diagram for nitrogen. Okay, remember that the red curves are going to represent the oxidation states of nitrogen in acidic medium and the blue curves are going to represent the oxidation states of nitrogen and their various species in basic medium. Okay, so the potentials are going to be given to you. You won't need to figure them out. I'm going to do an example at the end of the um, theory, just so you can see how we can construct this diagram from a Latimer diagram. And you'll see that it's, it's not that difficult, but it requires careful thought and construction of um, the graph itself. Okay, let's have a look at this information that you see on this slide. On the left hand side is a very easy um, frost diagram that shows the relationship for oxygen, the element oxygen. Uh, you will see there are a number of oxidation states um, and species involved, okay, two, three oxidation states. And we'll do the example at the end of the theory with this example, and you're going to actually see how to construct this, how to draw this. Okay, but what I need to explain to you is the diagram on the right. This is a general, this one here is a general structure of a frost diagram. It implies that we have, for element number whatever, we have two oxidation states. So this is one oxidation state here, and this is the second oxidation state here. Um, it's, it's labeled in such way that the slope of the line connecting two species having oxidation numbers in double prime and n prime, you know how to work out the slope, is going to be equal to the new times potential divided by the difference in the oxidation states. So what does this mean? There are three things that we can determine from this graph. Number one, the more positive the slope, the more positive the standard potential of the couple. Number two, the oxidation state of the couple with a more positive slope is the one that's going to undergo reduction. Okay, and number three, the reducing agent of the couple with a less positive slope 
is the one that's going to undergo oxidation. All right, this is not immediately clear in the diagram on the right hand side because there is only uh, two species and we have a very positive slope. All right, moving on. Just two more examples to show you for the element chlorine on the left and for manganese on the right, what the frost diagrams look like. And as I said to you, we will do an example to show you how to do the construction of these. Okay. okay, now what other information can a frost diagram tell us? Well, there's a number of different ways that we can interpret a frost diagram. So what you're seeing on the slide at the moment is six different representations um, of uh, various elements and the oxidation numbers. And if we go through them carefully, um, we'll be able to understand what is what is happening. So let's have a look at the first one over here, diagram A, this one here. OK, what is this diagram tell, telling us? It's telling us that there is a way to measure reduction potential. And that in this, this sense, the one that's got the higher standard potential is the line between these two points here and here. And this one between this, this line here has the lower standard potential. So it gives us an idea of which one has a lower potential, which one has a higher potential. It's as simple as that. Let's look at diagram B. Diagram B shows us the tendency towards oxidation or reduction. So if I'm starting over here with this particular species, OK, and I go with an upward positive slope, OK, that indicates that this species here will be oxidized. All right. And if we start over here with this species and we move downwards in this direction like this, OK, that indicates that this species here is going to be reduced. So that is how we can determine um, the tendency towards oxidation or reduction. OK, diagrams C and D give us an indication of disproportionation. All right, so if we're looking at a couple, um, we will see we're going from this species to this species to this species. And if I look between this one and this one, that is also a couple, this species here will tend to disproportionate. And the same is true in this diagram. And this one just shows you the delta G values being negative. And if the delta G value is negative, it implies that the reaction is spontaneous, which means that disproportionation will be spontaneous. And then lastly, we have um, the oxidation number, uh, sorry, the diagrams E and F. And these diagrams show us the indication of a species to comproportionate. OK, so in this sense here, we have this species and this species will be less stable and they will tend to comproportionate to this species over here. And again, in diagram F, it shows that the delta G is negative, meaning that the comproportionation reaction is going to spontaneously happen. OK, in order for us to really understand what's going on, the easiest would be for us to do an example. All right, so there is an example that gives us an idea of how to do this. It says, please construct a frost diagram from a Latimer diagram. The example is example 5.10 in the textbook. And it gives the Latimer diagram as follows. Um, it doesn't give it as, as much detail, but I'm using a more uh, complicated one, or not more complicated, a more expressive one to show you uh, how to do these things. So what we're looking at here is we're looking at um, the movement from oxygen to hydrogen peroxide to water. Okay, And we are also then um, looking at the full thing moving from oxygen all the way through to water. The first thing we need to do is calculate the oxidation number of each species. So we know that oxidation, oxygen has an oxidation number of zero. Hydrogen peroxide 
the oxidation number of oxygen is minus 1, and water, the oxidation number of oxygen is minus 2. And now we need to plot the graph of nu E versus N, where nu is the number of electrons transferred between the species, E is the reduction potential for the specific couple, and N is the oxidation number. Okay, so here is the, re the um, reduction potential values. Remember, they're written on top of the arrows, as I've explained to you in the previous section for Latimer diagrams. And then we need to obviously calculate the new values um, based on what we know about the oxidation numbers. All right, so the first thing we need to do is construct a graph. Okay, and we've drawn a graph of nu versus E, and we put the oxidation numbers here, and I've drawn a scale on the y-axis that will be pertinent. All right, so now we need to start with the oxygen, where the potential and the oxidation state are both at zero. Okay, so now our graph has a starting point, which is over here. Now we need to look at the reduction of the first couple, which is donated by the red bracket from oxygen to peroxide. Okay, so the oxidation number of peroxide is minus one, and the reduction potential is roughly 0.7. Okay, it gives it as an exact value of 0 0.695, but we can, just for the purposes of the example, just use it as 0 0.7. Then what we need to do is we have a change of number of electrons is 1, okay, but it's a negative change. It's going from 0 to minus 1. Therefore, we multiply the number of electrons by the potential. So it's number of electrons minus 1 times 0 0.7 gives us minus 0 0.7, which is what we plot on the graph. So it'd be this point over here. Okay, then we connect a line between the two points. And that's self-explanatory. Now let's look at the reduction of the last couple, which is donate, denoted by the green bracket. Okay, so we're going to work from oxygen all the way through to water. The oxidation number of oxygen in water is minus 2, and the electrode potential in this example is given to us as plus 1.23. Here it is over here. However, as I mentioned previously, you may need to calculate this value using that special Nernst equation that I've given you uh, in the past. All right. So we do exactly the same thing. We take the new value, which is now minus 2, because remember we're going from 0 oxidation state here to minus 2 oxidation state here. And so therefore, the value of new and the oxidation number are the same. So it's minus 2 multiplied by the electrode potential of plus 1.23 gives us a value of minus 2.46. We then plot this on the graph and we connect the points and lines that are already drawn. And you will see that my graph that I've drawn over here is going to resemble the graph that the textbook shows in terms of the red line over here. Okay, guys, um, this concludes the section on frost diagrams. Um, remember, ask questions. There are many examples in the textbook that you can do and to reconstruct them. Um, I will give you examples to practice as well. And remember that you can ask as many questions as needs be. We'll move on to the next section shortly.